In this video, we're going to look at the numerical solution of the steady one-dimensional heat conduction equation with generation. I'm going to drive this using the finite volume method, and so you'll notice that I'm never going to start from the heat conduction equation that we derived using finite volumes that we shrunk down to zero size by dividing by the volume in order to get a partial differential equation. We can keep the finite volumes and get the exact same numerical results, and then I'll show you some examples of use. So imagine we have a one-dimensional bar. Now we're going to set uh, boundary conditions on the A side and the B side, and we'll allow those to be any of our types of boundary conditions. But we're going to assume that the problem is steady, so there's no changes in time. And we're going to assume that it's one-dimensional, so conduction is only along the length of the bar. For now, we'll assume that we have a constant cross-sectional area. We'll specify what that is. We'll assume that the conductivity is constant, and we'll assume that we have a constant generation within that bar. Uh, each of those last three assumptions are very easy to modify so that we don't make those assumptions. We're going to break it up into finite volumes. And to break it up into finite volumes, I'm going to use a scheme like this. So for, say, for example, that I want to solve over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 points. I'm going to center 5 of those points uh, in my volume, where I have a constant delta x. And I'm going to let the two boundary volumes be half volumes, where I have a delta x over 2. So in total, I will have seven control volumes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. But two of them will be half size, so the spacing is actually 6 delta x. Now let's look at this. I'm going to label my temperatures uh, according to T0 at the A side going up to the total number that I want, minus 1, because I started with 0, so Tn minus 1 at the B side. And if I look at three successive points anywhere in there, each of these volumes are going to be the same. We'll drive the equation for them. So I can take the one of interest, I'll say it's this one for now, and I'll just call it Ti, and the one on the west side, or going towards the A side, is Ti minus 1, and the one on the east side, or going towards uh, the B side, is Ti plus 1. And so if I look at that general interior volume, I'm looking to look at, I'm solving the control volume for Ti, I have a constant generation in it, and my conservation of energy equation, of course, is E in minus E out plus E gen is equal to the energy stored. I'm going to assume it's steady, and we have assumed it's steady, so the stored term is going to go to zero. And the volumetric generation is simply that watts per meter squared Q dot that we specify times the cross-sectional area that we specify times this space, AC times delta X, being the volume of the control volume. The EN, I have to draw my arrows on it. So there's my EN. I'm going to assume that I have energy conducting in uh, at this face towards the A side or towards the I minus 1 side, and I'm going to assume it's going out to the I plus 1 side. Now if we notice that our spacing was constant at delta X, that also means that our spacing between these two points is delta X, and our spacing between these two points is delta X. And so we can take a forced order approximation of our E in term using our first order estimate of the derivative, Ti minus Ti minus 1 over delta X, and of course Fourier's law, multiplying that temperature gradient estimate by the conductivity times the cross-sectional area will give us our E in. Exact same thing on the outside, except on the outside, our temperature gradient is Ti plus 1 minus Ti over delta x again, and of course multiplied by minus Kac. So I can put this all together. I have the energy in, the energy out, the energy being generated, and it's all equal to zero. Now I'm going to want to solve this um, for all of these volumes, and I'm going to want to put it in a matrix form. So ultimately, I want something that's going to be in the form of a matrix A times my unknown temperatures is equal to an unknown uh, vector B. And so if I look at this, for this one particular volume, I have three unknown temperatures with three coefficients multiplying those unknown temperatures. It's Ti minus 1, Ti, and Ti plus 1. And my unknown coefficients, I can look at all the things that are multiplying each of those things. So if I look, for example, at Ti minus 1, it only appears here. And what's multiplying it, the negatives will cancel out. I'll get a Kac over delta x. So following through that, Ti minus 1 is Kac over delta x times Ti minus 1. If I look at Ti, the coefficient of Ti, well, it appears here with a minus Kac over delta x. And it also appears here with a minus 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 Kac over delta x, so that altogether, contributing from the En and the E out, 
I have a minus 2 kAc over delta x for Ti. And for Ti plus 1, it only appears here. Negatives canceling out, I get a positive kAc over delta x. So if I write that then in my matrix formulation, oh sorry, and of course that is equal to minus q dot ac delta x. I move that over to my b side, and I see that these are all knowns. q dot is specified, ac is specified, delta x is known as soon as I specify the number of volumes. And so this is all known stuff that goes into my b matrix. And these are my three unknown temperatures. So I can write that in my matrix form. There are my coefficients for ti minus 1, ti, and ti plus 1, and my known b for this one particular volume. Now when I look at my geometry, I have for this particular example with seven points that I'm going to solve for. I'm going to number the control volumes from control volume 0 up to control volume 6. And this interior one that we just derived the equation for applies to all five of these interior control volumes. I can write that energy equation, that conservation of energy equation for each one of these five and the equation is identical. I also have two boundary elements. I'll have to write a new equation for my boundary elements, and we'll look at that after we look at the interior. But let's apply this to the matrix that we're ultimately going to solve. So looking at my control volume, at my set of control volumes, for all five of these, I have this exact same equation, and all I'm doing is moving what i is. If I'm looking at this control volume, my i is going to be 1, because that's control volume 1, and my i minus 1 is going to be 0, because that's my control volume 0 and my i plus 1 will be control volume 2. So let's put that into our matrix. We'll start with a general matrix where we have a square matrix because, of course, each line of our matrix is conservation of energy for a given control volume. So the first line is conservation of energy for that boundary control volume, control volume 0. Then I have my 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 interior volumes, which I have derived the equation for here. And finally, I have uh, the volume at the end. And each line is one application of that conservation of energy equation. So let's do the interior volumes. So this volume here, this first, second row in my matrix, is now conservation of energy for control volume 1. I know the expression looks like this. I know that my i is equal to 1 for control volume 1. So my i minus 1 is 0, and my kac over delta x goes into the a10. I know the i is 1. And so my minus 2 kAc over delta x goes into this position. And the kAc over delta x goes into this position. There are no other unknown temperatures. Um, the last four do not factor into this equation for this volume. And so these are all zeros. Let's move on, move up, and we'll look at control volume 2. Now my i is equal to 2, i minus 1 is equal to 1, and i plus 1 is equal to 3. So we have exactly the same equation. We've just shifted over one because we've moved over one control volume. The temperatures that don't appear in my governing equation, T0 and T456, are all zeros. Well, we can move down and do that for each control volume on the interior. Control volume 4, control volume 5. And now we've completely filled our matrix except for our boundary conditions. We need to do something different to apply boundary conditions for these last two. And then you'll see that we have a, a matrix of known coefficients, a matrix of known um, B values that account for our generation. And note too that if we had no generation, these would have all been zeros. So let's look at a boundary condition. And I'll look at all three types of boundary conditions that we can use. The simplest boundary condition is our constant temperature. We'll say that the temperature for our control volume 0 is equal to that Ta that we specify. Well, that's very easy. If I want to enforce that T0 is equal to Ta, all I have to do is put a 1 in the diagonal and zeros in all of the others and put Ta in my B side, and then this has to solve, of course, T0 is equal to Ta. And we could do the same thing at the outlet if we wanted to, but I'll leave that for you to look at. The second boundary condition is the heat flux specified. If I want to say what is Q double prime coming in at my CV0, well, I start with my conservation of energy equation again. I have E in minus E out plus E gen is 0 because it's steady. I've written those here on my diagram. And now my control volume is a spacing delta x over 2. But of course, the distance between my temperature at the boundary and my next interior temperature which, of course, this should have said T0 and T1. 
uh, and the spacing between t0 and t1 is still a full delta x. This is still a full delta x apart. So my en is now given by the specified heat flux that I know, q double prime at a is some value I put in, times the cross-sectional area, that'll give me my en. My e out is identical to before, my first order approximation of the temperature gradient, T1 minus T0 over delta X times minus KAC. And my E gen is the same except for the generation is happening inside this volume. And so when we calculate the volume, it's the cross-sectional area times delta X over 2. I can rearrange that into the form of the matrix that I want. And what I can see here is that I have only two temperatures participating in this, a T1 and T0. And so I will, there will be no AI minus 1, which is good because I don't have any temperatures outside of my volume. So rearranging it into my matrix form then, it will simply be A0 and A1 times T0 and T1 is equal to my matrix of Bs. Collecting as before, I have a minus KAC over delta X for T0, a positive KAC over delta X for T1, and on my B side, I have the term that came about because of the generation, Moving this over, minus q dot ac delta x over 2. But I also have this brought over to the b side, the known heat flux times the cross-sectional area. So there's my matrix formulation for that. And if I wanted to put a constant heat flux boundary condition in, I would use that equation in order to put in the two coefficients that we solved for, minus kac delta x on the t0, kac over delta x on the t1, and on our b side, minus QAC delta X over 2, and minus the heat flux times the cross-sectional area. Our final boundary condition is convection specified. If we're going to specify a convection boundary condition, of course we start with the same situation, E in minus E out plus E generation is equal to 0. And now my E in is given by the convection coefficient that I will give, the cross-sectional area, the ambient temperature at A that I will give, and the unknown temperature that we're going to solve for of T0. E out is identical to the last case, and E gen is identical to the last case. And now let's just rearrange this into the form that we want, solving for the coefficients of T0 and T1, and for the constants B, to put it into this form here so we can put it into our matrix. And we'll see that when we do that, we now have on the T0, we have an HAC multiplying that T0 and it's negative. So my coefficient multiplying T1 is HAC, but we also have the minus KAC, three negatives, so it's negative, minus KAC, T0 over delta X. The T1, negatives cancel out, KAC over delta X multiplying T1. And in the constants, we have exactly as we had before for the generation, but now we have an HAC T infinity, which we bring over and make negative on the B side. So we can easily implement that one too into our matrix if we wish to have convection. And here's what it would look like, putting in those two coefficients on T0 and T1, and putting in the proper B. And of course, we could repeat this same exercise for the boundary conditions on this side, then we would have a complete matrix that we can solve. Solving that is very easy. All I have to do, of course, is compute the inverse of that matrix A, multiply it by my B, and I have my unknown temperatures. Fortunately, that's very, very easy to do in Python. All I need to do is type with my numpy, Linalge solve a comma b and it will solve that for me. There are more efficient ways to do this. If we were doing this on very large systems, we'd want to do this differently. But for our purposes, this is perfectly adequate for the small systems that we'll be looking at. So I've implemented that for you into a Python function. Um, and I've called it 1D gen, and we'll give it the length, the cross-sectional area, the desired conductivity, the desired volumetric heat generation rate. We'll specify two boundary conditions either constant temperature, constant heat flux, or convection specified. We'll give it the number of points. And if we set verbose equal to true, it will give us information about the energy balance uh, in, the, in our rod. Here's my first example to test this out, make sure that it's working. Let's look at an example with no generation. We'll say the length is 1, the cross-sectional area is 0 0.01, so it's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, giving a cross-sectional area of 0.01 meters squared. We'll say there's no generation, setting Q dot to 0. I'll give the conductivity of 1, and I'll specify two constant temperature boundary conditions. A will be 100 degrees Celsius, and B will be 10 degrees Celsius. Well, now I know the answer to this. Of course, if my temperature difference 
is 90 degrees and my cross-sectional area is 0 0.01, then I know I have to get the heat rate going into that bar 0.9 watts. There's no generation, so what's going out at the other end, out of the bar, is 0.9 watts. I have no generation because Q dot was zero, and I can check my energy balances. The imbalance in this solution because of uh, the precision in the computer is times 10 to the minus 16. So on 0.9 watts, I have an imbalance of 10 to the minus 16. This is a very, very good solution. And of course, if I plot it, I've only used four points to calculate this. And of course, if I plot it, it will be a straight line. I didn't bother putting the plot on, but it'll be a straight line. And we can use any number of points and get the exact solution. Now let's look at a case, symmetric case with generation. Same conditions, the cross-sectional area is the same, the length is the same, but now I have a small Q dot. I put one, I put the conductivity of one, and now I put symmetric boundary conditions. So I've said that uh, 10 degrees at A, 10 degrees at B, so it's symmetric, and now I'm solving this using different numbers of points. And using different numbers of points, so I've started with three points, the blue line here, and so of course the solution looks like a triangle because I only have three points. But if you notice, the heat rate, I've just, I've just put it at A here because it is symmetric. It is exactly what we expect it to be. At A, the heat rate is minus 0 0.005 watts, and it's symmetric, so it's, it is the same if we look at it, 0 0.005 watts at B. And it's perfect even with only three points. And the reason it's perfect with only three points is because, of course, I have calculated it by estimating this gradient using a parabolic fit of these three points. And I've done that with every case. I, I estimate the gradient at this surface using a parabolic fit of the first three points. And so I always get identically the exact right heat rate going out because, of course, this solution is a quadratic. That If we look at the analytic solution for this case, it is quadratic, and therefore I get a perfect answer no matter how many volumes I have. But as I add more and more volumes, going from the blue line to the orange line to the green line, uh, ultimately to the purple line, you see that I'm getting a much better resolution of the temperature profile. You could, of course, compare this to the analytic solution, and you would see that you're getting extremely good agreement. And you can calculate in your head uh, that with a volumetric generation of 1 and a length of 1, and a cross-sectional area of zero, that the total heat rate out should, of course, be 0 0.01, and it should be symmetric as it is. So we have a very good solution for this case. Now, we have analytic solutions for these cases, so there's not that much point in doing this, except that it's quite simple to do. But let's look at a case that we don't have an analytic solution for, that we haven't looked at so far, and that is if we put convection boundaries. So in this case, I'll take my same bar, I'll raise my Q dot a little bit to 100 watts per cubic meter, keep the conductivity at 1, but now I'm going to put convection boundaries, and I'll say it's 10 watts per meter squared Kelvin at A, with a temperature, amb ambient temperature of 100, and I'll say it's a convection coefficient of 25 on the B side, with an ambient temperature of 50. I'll solve my problem, showing the energy balance here, and we see, of course, now it's not symmetric, and now these temperatures this temperature is certainly higher than 50 because we have a convection layer out there and we can verify that this is working perfectly as well. Similarly, this temperature is slightly higher than 100. We have a very small heat flux out of the bar, minus 0.035 watts. Uh, because we have generation in this bar and because it's not symmetric, most of it is going out this way, but a small amount is going out this way. And of course, that means the temperature gradient has to be this way for it to be going out. This temperature is higher than the ambient set of 100 and we could calculate with that convection coefficient that this was exactly the right temperature, which indeed it is. And again, you can see we have a heat rate of the bar going out because it's negative at A, 0 0.035, 1 watts, and we have almost 1 watt going out this way. So the total going out is, in fact, uh, equal to that what is generated. We've generated 1 watt within the bar, and the imbalance between what's generated and what's going out is of the order 10 to the minus 15. So again, a very, very good solution. Now, it would be very simple to modify this procedure in order to have varying um, conductivities, varying cross-sectional areas, or to have regions where we have generation and regions where we don't have generation, or in fact generation that uh, was varying with some function. These would be very, very simple additions to this code. And hopefully this is a good introduction to the power of the numerical methods and how you verify them against the known solutions uh, to make sure that they're working well.